Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. When we fall in love, we are following our hearts and rarely listening to our heads. That special butterfly feeling in your stomach can drown out the common sense your brain is trying to transmit. You may not really be compatible or have nothing in common, but the chemistry you feel trumps your doubts. This is often true for people who find themselves in abusive relationships. You may even know about past concerning behavior and still not listen to your head. He's changed, you tell yourself. That's all in the past. Or worse, I can change him. It will be different with me. We are in love. The first time he loses his temper and screams at you, you tell yourself that he overreacted, but it was minor. He has calmed down, and you file away whatever it was he said you did to upset him. Even though you know in your heart it wasn't really what you did. The first time he hits you, the shock of the violence is more painful than the actual slap or punch. Then he is so sorry. I love you, baby. I would never really hurt you. But he already has. And maybe now you feel trapped in more ways than just what your heart tells you. Maybe you are carrying his child. So the lies you tell yourself to stay with him become even more desperate. Once the baby is here, he will change. He will stop this violence. We're bringing a child into the world. But the baby doesn't change anything. His behavior begins to escalate, and you now have to protect your child. That's the most important thing. And what if your heart hasn't changed? What if you still love him? That is a difficult concept for many people about women who stay in abusive relationships. Why doesn't she just leave is their mantra, as if leaving is so easy. You are now financially tied to him as much as you are emotionally. But the people who don't understand that really don't understand how you can still love him. But it happens, so you stay, despite the surging violence, despite the voice in your head. You learn to run from him. You learn to shield your children. You learn to accept that he rarely apologizes anymore. You learn that his threats may one day come true. You learn that you're spiraling, but can't see a way out. Then he makes good on his worst threat. You fear for your life. So for the first time, you fight back. Then you find yourself caught in the wheels of the justice system. And now you really see no way out. Welcome to episode 186, Behind Closed Doors, The Janae Carroll Case. For over a decade, South Carolina has been one of the most dangerous states for women, especially those who are victims of domestic violence. At one point, the rate of women murdered by men in South Carolina was more than double the national average. According to WCSC Live News, Over 80,000 South Carolina women are subjected to domestic violence each year. If you live in South Carolina and are a woman, there is a 42% chance you will experience domestic violence in your lifetime. That is so high. If the lottery had that kind of likelihood, we'd all go broke buying gas station scratchers. But why is this happening? Why are women in South Carolina in danger? How could South Carolina become the hotbed for domestic violence that it currently is? There are a lot of moving and intersecting factors. First, you've got South Carolina's strong, but perhaps outdated beliefs about marriage and women's roles within that marriage. Then you've got the lack of available women's shelters and resources for domestic violence victims. And finally, South Carolina's laws tend to punish victims when they lash out at their abusers. And that's because they make it hard for the court to recognize a version of self-defense that aligns with domestic abuse. All courts recognize straightforward self-defense pretty well. As in, 
You hit me, so I hit you. Self-defense, right? But what if I knew you were going to hit me because you're my boyfriend who always hits me? Even if you hadn't yet taken the swing, I knew it was coming. And what if I tried to stop you before the blow? Is that self-defense? Well, in cases of domestic violence, it probably should be. The Post and Courier said it best in their 2015 Pulitzer winning article, Till Death Do Us Part. South Carolina is a state where the deck is stacked against women trapped in the cycle of abuse. And in the case of Janae Carroll, that's more apparent than ever. Tiffany Janae Carroll was born on February 18, 1987, to her mother, Deborah Darlene Carroll. Janae has two sisters and two brothers. For the most part, her family calls her by her middle name, Janae, so that's what I'm going to call her. From the way Janae's family speaks about her now, I have to imagine her younger years were full of love. Big hugs whenever the family was able to get together. Lots of amazing food shared around the holidays. Janae's family cared, and still do care, about her, her children, and each other. Janae attended Greenwood High School in Greenwood, South Carolina. While there, she was a good student. She usually received B's or above and often made the honor roll. She graduated in 2005. Greenwood is a small city in Northeast South Carolina, and it's the county seat for Greenwood County. It began as a piece of land a rich man built a summer mansion on before burgeoning into a railroad town in 1852. Today, it has a population of around 22,000, and more equal demographics than you usually see. In the 2020 census, black people made up almost 44% while white people were around 30%. The rest of the population is mostly Hispanic. Greenwood is home to Lander University, where many locals go to attend. Most of the civilian population is employed in manufacturing and healthcare. The summers in Greenwood are warm but not stifling rarely going over 90 degrees. Greenwood is home to the South Carolina Festival of Flowers, which continues to be named one of the Southeast Tourism Society's top 20 events. It brought in over 80,000 visitors in the past few years with an economic impact of about $3.3 million. Also in 2008, the Topiary Project was launched, which has become the signature event. Presently, there are 42 topiaries in the beautiful Greenwood Square. Greenwood has long been known as the Emerald City, though the origin of the nickname is not clear. Many speculate that the abundance of very green trees in the area led to the nickname, specifically, I'm sure, the gorgeous topiaries. Also, the South Carolina Festival of Discovery is the premier event of the year, along with the Festival of Flowers. The event started in 2000, celebrating the history, culture, food, arts, crafts, music, and people of South Carolina and Greenwood County. There is a blues cruise that celebrates the sound of the blues with numerous local musical artists performing at uptown venues. And the Kansas City Barbecue Society and Hash Cook-Off focuses on the rich tradition of Carolina barbecue. But along with the amazing arts and culture is the grim economic realities. About 22% of families and 40% of the population are below the poverty line, including 34% of those under age 18 and 18% of those age 65 and over. These realities contribute to the crime rate, which is high in comparison to other small cities in South Carolina and the rest of the country. You stand a 1 in 84 chance of being a victim of violent crime or property crime in Greenwood, while it's one in 192 for the state of South Carolina. But there is no denying that Greenwood is also a beautiful city that flourishes more as a small town mindset. Janae grew up with this city with a small town feel with so much cultural significance, and she initially thrived there. Five miles away from Greenwood High School where Janae went on the other side of town was Emerald High School. And this is the school that a young man named William Jamal Johnson attended. He went by Jamal, though his Facebook page says William, but his family calls him Jamal, so I will too. 
Despite their different high schools, Janae and Jamal actually knew each other quite well. They were childhood friends. Jamal was only three years younger than Janae. They had mutual friends in the small city and grew up knowing each other. But as young adults, Janae and Jamal led very different lives. While Janae was a strong student and a personable young woman, Jamal struggled more often. He just had more red flags. When he was 19 years old, he was charged with kidnapping. Throughout his 20s, Jamal would continue to build a criminal record. On multiple occasions, he was arrested for sexually assaulting, kidnapping, and beating women. Sometimes they were his girlfriends, and sometimes they weren't. But although Jamal wasn't on anyone's version of the straight and narrow, he was trying. He was interested in cars. So after high school, he enrolled in the automotive tech program at Piedmont Technical College. But it's unclear if he was able to get a job working with cars. There were a lot of pictures of cars on his Facebook, so he was clearly passionate about them. Sometime late in the year 2015, 28-year-old Janae and 25-year-old Jamal began dating. They might have had a bit of a slow start because it's sometimes reported that they began dating in early 2016. You know how it goes. It can be hard to label a relationship right away. Are we actually girlfriend and boyfriend? It's complicated. But soon after Janae and Jamal started dating, they had to navigate an entirely different set of labels, mom and dad. And that's because only months into their relationship, in June of 2016, Tiffany gave birth to their son. Janae had already had three children of her own, so she wasn't new to motherhood. It's unclear if Jamal had other children. Regardless, I'm sure there were many emotions going through both of them when they realized she was pregnant. After all, Janae was aware of the rumors surrounding Jamal's checkered past with women. She knew he hadn't always been kind towards his female partners, but Janae didn't know the exact details of Jamal's violent behavior. She wasn't aware of every single arrest charge, punch thrown, or kidnapping, and Jamal certainly didn't tell her. But still, there was reason to celebrate. Janae was going to have a baby. A brand new life was entering the world. It's exciting. And so far, Jamal seemed like he was okay to be her baby's father. In fact, he reassured Janae that he would do better. According to Janae, it truly seemed like Jamal wanted a happy family. But over time, Jamal's true colors began to show. According to Janae, like so many abusers, Jamal's abuse started slowly. She alleged that at first, he would only insult her and slap her. But a few years into their relationship, his behavior greatly escalated. He was violent, and he frequently abused Janae. On at least one occasion, he pushed Janae, who was pregnant at the time, down the stairs. Then he strangled her until she passed out. And according to the Post and Courier, neighbors frequently saw Janae hide bruises with sunglasses and makeup. At his worst, Janae alleged that Jamal would hurt her children. Neighbors also verified this information. They would often take Janae's children into their homes to help get them away from Jamal's wrath. And they frequently saw Janae protecting her children, sometimes even Jamal's own newborn son, from his harsh blows. And of course, this didn't go unnoticed by authorities. Between May of 2016 and September of 2017, the police went to Jamal and Janae's home at least eight times. Eight times. But usually, Jamal would leave before the officers arrived. Then, when the coast was clear, he would return. By that point, he'd be a completely different man, loving, apologetic. And Janae, who did care deeply for Jamal and wanted to hope he would change, welcomed him back. Usually, no one pressed any charges. And the whole ordeal was forgotten until it happened the next time. If you're familiar with the cycle of abuse, this is very familiar. It's the perfect example of the horrific cycle. There's a tension building stage where the abuser creates a sense of fear and hostility. Little arguments become big arguments very, very quickly. And then there's a violent episode where the abuser hurts someone, either verbally, physically, or both. And finally, the abuser tries to reconcile the situation through apologies, gifts, and promises they assure their victims that this is the last time they swear. 
I can't imagine how frightening that was for Janae, especially since, before the fall of 2017, she had given birth to a second child by Jamal. The cycle of abuse is already so challenging to escape. With children on the line, it can feel nearly impossible. According to the Greenwood Police, they tried to point Janae towards support and resources for domestic violence victims. But, according to police spokesman Jonathan Link, all efforts were rejected. And we have to remember that that's not because Janae thought things were fine. She didn't. She would later tell her psychologist that Jamal had explained to her, the only way you'll leave me is to kill me. Janae probably feared for her life and her children's lives if she took steps to get out from under Jamal's thumb, but she knew she couldn't live like this forever. So on Monday, September 18th, 2017, Janae and Jamal had been together for almost two years. She was 30 years old and he was 27. And on that particular evening, the couple was nearing an intense, unavoidable boiling point. A fight broke out, and it was a big one. Because Janae was finally done. She was ready to leave Jamal. But he could not let that happen. Janae had gathered her belongings into bags, but Jamal took them from her and threw them out. When Janae told Jamal he could keep everything because she just wanted out, he still wouldn't let her go. He blocked the exits with his body. If she had any doubts about ending her relationship with Jamal before, she didn't now. She knew this was the right decision. Jamal's sister was at the scene during this altercation, and she took Janae's children outside to get them away from the fight. After that, no one is sure of the specific details of what happened between Janae and Jamal. According to Janae, Jamal had grabbed her by the hair to stop her from leaving the home. After a brief struggle, she escaped his grasp. Then, she fled to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. Jamal then threatened to break Janae's arm, which, according to Janae, he had done before. Jamal allegedly said, you better not cut me. And then Janae blacked out. She has some memories of the following events, but not many. Luckily, the police found evidence that painted a general picture of what occurred. Wielding the kitchen knife, Janae sliced Jamal on the arm and the ankle. Then she stabbed him in the chest. As soon as she realized what she had done and how much Jamal was bleeding, she tried to apply pressure to his chest to stop the bleeding. Then she wiped off the knife and threw it behind the stove. It's unclear who, but someone called 911 and emergency responders arrived. The police spoke to Janae and medics took Jamal to the hospital, but it was too late. 27-year-old William Jamal Johnson died from the chest stab wound in Self Regional Medical at 6.32 p.m. As Janae explained what happened to the police officers, her story shifted pretty significantly. One officer said that Janae had originally told him she was the one to throw the first blow, but she would later deny that. She said she had never, ever initiated violence against Jamal. Another officer explained that Janae said she had found Jamal already bleeding. Then when the bleeding Jamal had charged her, she had fought back. These tricky details are important. They would help or hinder Janae's self-defense case in court. So establishing that Jamal was at fault, not Janae, would be very important for Janae's potential trial and sentencing especially in South Carolina, a state notorious for convicting victims for killing their abusers. The next day on Tuesday, September 19th, Tiffany Janae Carroll was arrested. She was charged with murder and possession of a weapon while committing a violent crime. While in police custody, Janae said, I didn't mean to hurt him. I swear, I usually just leave. It just got out of hand. Janae was clearly battling her own emotions. According to her conversations with a psychologist, Dr. Lois Veronin, Janae was feeling incredibly guilty about Jamal's death and about not getting herself and her children out of that relationship sooner. Dr. Veronin also diagnosed Janae with PTSD and major depressive disorder linked to severe domestic violence. According to the Post and Courier, Dr. Veronin said, She was caught in a difficult trap of ever-increasing violence. 
The violent and degrading acts perpetrated by Jamal produced cognitive, affective, and behavioral changes in Janae that have come to be known as battered woman syndrome. But while Janae was conflicted over killing Jamal, many others were not. In fact, her family applauded her actions. According to the Post and Courier, Janae set them free when she killed the abusive Jamal. Janae's community and others rallied around her. Many, many people contributed money for childcare. And an online petition in support of Janae has received about 33,000 signatures. Originally, it looked like Janae was going to trial. It even looked like she might win. Sure, the prosecutors were preparing to argue that she had not acted in self-defense, but there was a lot of empirical evidence that Jamal had abused Janae and her children in the past. Even if Janae struggled to prove this instance of abuse, Jamal had a known track record of serious violence against many women, and Janae was figuring out her own defense strategies and legal team. But then, in a shocking turn of events, Janae pleaded guilty but mentally ill to voluntary manslaughter. Her younger sister, Danielle, said that Janae felt pressured to plead guilty. Someone had explained to her if she went to trial, she risked a 30-year prison sentence. Danielle said she was scared. And you know what? It is a scary situation. And it would be a difficult decision for literally anyone, let alone a single mother of five children. It makes sense that she would want the least amount of prison time possible. A trial might have felt too risky. In December of 2019, a judge sentenced 33-year-old Tiffany Janae Carroll to 15 years in prison. With time served, she would be released in 2032 when she is 45 years old. But Janae and many others hope they won't have to wait that long for her release. When sentencing Janae Carroll, Circuit Court Judge Letitia Verdon allowed Janae to be eligible for parole after serving 25% of her sentence, which means she could be out of prison after serving three years and nine months in prison, which would give her time to still raise her own children. This specific 25% to parole decision is important, and that's because it honors Janae's experiences as a domestic violence victim. Typically, People convicted of manslaughter serve at least 33% of their sentence before they are eligible for parole. On the other hand, 25% is standard for domestic violence victims acting in self-defense. The judge believed Janae's version of events. She believed Janae had been abused. And then Judge Verdon did Janae one better. She gave her permission to spend the Christmas holiday with her family. So Janae was able to go home, get in matching pajamas with her smiling kids, open some presents, and have a nice holiday before beginning her prison sentence. And on December 26th of 2019, Janae turned herself in and continued serving her time. Shortly after that Christmas of 2019, COVID hit the United States like a ton of bricks. And extra cautious prison protocols were enacted in prisons across the nation. These protocols ended all opportunities for visitation. In December of 2021, they were lifted, but Janae still hasn't seen her children since 2019, according to the Post and Courier. We're not sure why. Janae has not been forgotten, not by her family and not even by the public. Actually, the public continues to be pretty outraged by Janae's case. Domestic violence advocates have been pushing for her release, They feel strongly that her punishment did not fit her crime, and they were heartbroken when her first attempt at parole in September of 2022 failed. During the meeting, when the board asked Janae why she killed Jamal, she said, I was trying to protect myself. I was trying to leave when he leaped out at me and hit me again. I just kind of blanked out. I really don't remember what happened. I've been having a hard time forgiving myself and what happened with the whole situation. The judge asked why I didn't leave him or why did I stay, but it was hard leaving someone you love, and I had a lot of faith in him, and I just wanted to see him get better. After a 13-minute long meeting, the parole board denied Janae for three reasons. One, the seriousness of the offense. Two, the violence involved. And three, the use of a deadly weapon. No other explanation was given. 
Janae will be up for parole again this September in 2023. But until then, her supporters are seeking what the Post and Courier described as a long shot pardon. To receive this pardon, Janae would have to qualify for the most extraordinary of circumstances. And according to the South Carolina Department of Probation, Parole, and Pardon Services, Janae doesn't have the correct extraordinary circumstances. They don't think she'll qualify for this pardon. But State Representative and Attorney John McCravey says otherwise. He told the Post and Courier that he's filing the pardon application regardless of any naysayers. And along with the pardon application, McCravey will include a binder full of letters in support of Janae. McCravey assured the Post and Courier that he's sure they can expedite it. And Janae's family continues to stand behind her. Her 16-year-old daughter spoke to journalists, explaining, we just need her. And Janae's aunt, Brenda McCullough, had this to say in front of the Greenwood County Courthouse. She never should have been sentenced to jail. What she did was for survival for herself and her children. Brenda went on to add, the Janae we know would never have harmed a flea. On the day of Jamal's death, she was not herself. She was not the Janae we know and we want her home. She should be with her family. Today, Janae's children are being raised by her family and Janae is at the Camille Graham Correctional Prison. While there, she has received several work certificates. She's worked as both a landscaper and a custodian. According to Janae, she's received counseling and is in parenting classes. And if she were to be paroled, Janae wants to get her children into counseling as well. Like I mentioned before, she is up for parole again in September of 2023. All COVID restrictions have been lifted, so her many supporters will join her. And State Representative John McCravey plans to be there too. Janae's case has inspired McCravey to propose legislation to update South Carolina's laws on battered spouse syndrome. As reported by the Post and Courier, McCravey said, it is important for us to have awareness of this, not just for her, but for other women who suffer from battered women's syndrome and need some understanding of what this is and how it can affect women who've been abused. As it stands, this 28-year-old law does not specifically include non-marital relationships like Janae and Jamal's, and it doesn't have enough procedures about how to diagnose the syndrome. In South Carolina, which often ranks as the worst state in the U.S. for rates of women murdered by men, domestic violence laws should better reflect the victim's needs. And it's good to know that at least one politician is on the case. Janae's case is an important example, and if these laws are changed, it can make a big difference in future domestic violence cases. I know I will get comments and probably reviews about this episode, that like many people, I just choose to believe Janae. If Jamal had not had such a serious criminal record, and if the police had not been called to their home so many times, it might be different. This is not just one of those believe women cases. And I'm not deriding those cases either, but I know some listeners have a problem with it. Janae said even the judge asked her why she didn't just leave. It's not that simple. As Janae said herself, it wasn't just because she was scared. She did love Jamal. It's a complicated issue when you love the person and they promise to do better. On average, it takes at least seven times before a woman leaves her abuser for good, sometimes as many as nine. We cannot judge women or men in abusive relationships for that matter, for not being able to just walk out. There are so many issues at stake. First and foremost is financial. So many victims don't have the means. There is a women's shelter in Greenwood called Meg's House. But from Janae's statements, it would seem her main issue was that she truly loved Jamal and wanted him to get better. And we cannot judge her for that. We can judge if she acted in self-defense, but she was scared to roll the dice at trial and it's hard to blame her for that. But I want any local listeners to know that Meg's house is there for you and also has facilities for pets. And Meg's house also supports Janae. The executive director said, quote, we can't say enough times that she was a victim of domestic violence. Let's look at the issue of sentencing for women. 
although in Janae's case, it would seem the judge did all she could to be fair. Across the country, according to the ACLU, women who kill their partners will spend an average of 15 years behind bars, which is Janae's actual sentence, by the way, while men who kill their female partners serve much shorter sentences, on average between two to six years. Furthermore, some 77% of women in prison are there for killing men who they reported abused them. I've covered other cases where battered women syndrome was used in trial, and the results are certainly varying. It seems to depend a lot on the judge in the case. And Janae Carroll was blessed with a judge who had a great understanding of abused women who stand before her to be sentenced. If Representative McCravey is unsuccessful with a pardon, then all we can do is hope the parole board eventually honors the 25% Judge Verdon recommended. Janae will have served more than that much of her sentence at her next hearing in September. But her fate lies in the hands of the parole board and they have already rejected her once. If you would like to sign the change.org petition to release Janae, please click on the link in today's show notes. Like South Carolina, many other states are slowly working on legislation for battered women's syndrome as self-defense. Meanwhile, the prisons keep filling up with abuse victims. We can only hope and pray that someday the law will catch up with the realities of domestic abuse and that Janae will be released soon to raise her family. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank with additional research and writing by myself and of course all editorial opinions are my own. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Colleen Warner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brendan Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab or email sftcresearch at gmail.com. You'll get lost in a sea of emails if you send it to my main address. So this is the best way for me to get those little known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fried, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, and YouTube. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.